So let's solve this problem. So we have carbon monoxide, 25C1 ATM, standard conditions. It enters a furnace operating at steady state and burns completely with the perfect amount of air, 100% theoretical air. Entering The air enters in a separate stream at standard 25C and 1 ATM. So right away, they're going to get mixed inside the combustion chamber. This is pure CO. This is... 20, this is pure air or 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen. It then out go the products. Right? The chamber is well insulated, so Q dot is equal to zero. No heat transfer. It's a combustion chamber. What is W dot? It's a combustion chamber. There's no shaft power in or out. Determine the exit temperature, and there's the answer. 2,663 Kelvin. Well, because it's well insulated, guess what another name for that value of temperature is? It's the isothermal flame temperature, the isobaric flame temperature, the isoquadratic flame temperature. What is it? The, with no heat transfer, we call that, you know, adiabatic flame temperature. I know I'm doing a little tongue twister on you there, but it's that basically part A calls us to calculate the adiabatic flame temperature. So there's nothing new. We've already solved for the adiabatic flame temperature already, but it's really needed before you get to part B, which is the rate of entropy generation within the reactor. So let's just outline how you calculate the adiabatic flame temperature for part A. Okay, first of all, you've got to get a reaction equation, and you have to get this correct. Did I emphasize that? You have to get the reaction equation correct. So what's my fuel? Carbon monoxide. Where am I going to get my oxidizer from? From air, which is represented this way. Okay? And then you're going to produce CO2. Maybe you produce some water vapor, blah, blah, blah. And so you have a one stoichiometric coefficient always in front of the fuel. Don't change it. You come over and do a carbon balance. What coefficient goes right in front of the CO2? One. Now this is hard. You do a hydrogen balance. What's the coefficient in front of the H2O? Zero. You did it. Great. Okay. Now I do an oxygen balance to find this stoichiometric coefficient right there. What is that stoichiometric coefficient? It's one half, and he is correct. Now, if the student said it's one, what would I say to help him get back on track? Look for the oxygen in the fuel, and in this case, there is an oxygen in the fuel. So, I only need a half to get that balanced in oxygen. So the last thing is the nitrogen balance. So I'm going to multiply it half times 3.76. That's 1.88 N2s. Now, because I'm going to use these coefficients again and again, what I want to do is simplify it. So I'm going to get rid of this parenthesis right here and change this up. And I'm going to have 1.88 nitrogen. See how I got the 1.88? It's half of 3.76. Okay, so now I just have nice coefficients in front of everything over here on the reactant side and everything over here on the product side. First step. Then we did our energy balance. And our energy balance said that uh, Q dot my, uh, minus W dot, that's all zero for this problem. And then we had the sum over all the products. We had that stoichiometric coefficient, the enthalpy of formation, plus the enthalpy that the temperature of the product goes out at, minus the enthalpy reference of 298. And we, we have to do that for all the products. So let me do this. Let me say stoichiometric coefficient, blah, blah, blah. So I have to do it for the CO2. I have to do the same thing. Maybe I can get good at cutting and pasting. Do edit and do a copy. And then we'll do, come over here, we'll do an edit, do a paste. All right. So that's not going to be for my CO2. That'll be for my only other product is N2. No sense in doing the H2O. That's all zero, isn't it? And then 
I'm going to come right here and do a paste. Move that up a little bit. And we're going to put a minus for each of our reactants coming in. So we have the carbon monoxide. Edit, paste. Move that over here. So that's a minus stoichiometric coefficient for all these for the oxygen. And I need to scroll down a little bit and do an edit, paste for get minus sign. And this would be the nitrogen. And because it can be confusing, I sometimes say this is coming in with my reactants. This is going out with my products because this temperature is coming in. This temperature is coming in. And this temperature is coming in. Look good? Did I write it okay? Now, a lot of these terms cancel because the incoming carbon monoxide is at 298. Incoming oxygen is 298. Incoming nitrogen, 298. Enthalpy of formation of nitrogen is always zero. Enthalpy of formation of oxygen is always zero. I have to go and look up the enthalpy formation of the carbon dioxide, enthalpy formation, carbon monoxide. I have to get the, uh, the exit temperature. That's what we have to solve for, this TP, the product temperature, and this TP, product temperature. I'm going to probably guess a low value, maybe 1,000. Solve it. See, it's not equal to zero. That doesn't solve. It, it, you want this to be equal to zero. And uh, then I'll probably guess 3,000 bracketed linear interpolation and proof until I get it to be the, the product temperature, TP. TP comes in, what, 2663, if my memory is correct. Kelvin, let me look here. So does that look good? That's how we did it. Now for part B, which is the rate of entropy generation within the reactor. What we have to do is we have to write the second law. And that forces us to evaluate the absolute entropy. OK. In the interest of time, let me do this. There's our balanced reaction equation. This is the first law, where we don't know this temperature T exit or T2. All right. Uh, this actually is T1, and they cancel. I have a typo there, but you can see that they canceled right there. All you had is the enthalpy formation and the carbon monoxide coming in. You had the enthalpy formation of carbon dioxide, no, nothing for the enthalpy formation of nitrogen. This is the final correct at the 2663 for the two enthalpies. And uh, you can check it, and then it's zero is equal to close enough to zero. Okay. Second law. Well, it's the sigma dot divided by n dot of the fuel. And we have the carbon dioxide. So what we're going to have is a sum over all of the uh, uh, products, the stoichiometric coefficient S bar of that product. But what's S bar of the product? The S bar of the product is S bar naught, function of temperature only, minus R bar, natural log. And I'm just going to put Y of that product, Y sub I. So that's a mole fraction. OK, so we get the R bar, mole fractions, R bar, mole fractions, R bar, mole fractions, etc. OK. Oh, oh, I forgot, minus the sum over all the reactants of the same type of equation. But there, here it is written out. We, from the energy balance, know that the exit temperature is 2663. So what we do is we look up this S naught at 2663 for our exiting carbon dioxide, exiting nitrogen. For our incoming, it's evaluated at 293 or 298, 298, 298. So, um, these values you have to look up, um, multiply out the equation, and you get 165 
kilojoules per kelvin per kilomole of the fuel.